Friday afternoon. Uh, it's, um, it's days like today. I'm thrilled about the weekend because, Lord willing, we'll see most of you. And uh, that is a huge joy. And I hope that you'll have great joy in the Lord as well. There'll be a few differences on Sunday, but overall, the greatest similarity is that we're gathering together to worship the Lord. And that's what we want to focus on, that we can gather together in his name. Today we want to take just a tiny little fraction of a piece of a topic and talk about it because of how massive it is. Uh, last week, uh, Gary, you had mentioned uh, just about, uh, uh, about uh, the idea of Christ in the Old Testament in a specific way. Do you want to remind us what that little comment was that's spurring on an entire topic today? Yeah, so in the story of everything, we've been in certainly encouraging uh, everyone to see the glory of Christ that is through all scriptures. Uh, Jesus' own testimony was that the, uh, the, the, the law and the prophets testify of me. So that's not really any sort of debate among people that take the Bible seriously, that it is pointing toward Christ. Where there is uh, some discussion, some sometimes heated discussion, is on how explicitly is the is Christ as a person in the Old Testament, both in his sometimes even physical manifestation, and then how how is the gospel presented? Is there a, a clarity to the gospel presentation that we see even in the Old Testament? And that's what people do discuss within the evangelical world. So. Luke, we, we need to start off by maybe stepping back here and, and take a, a big picture approach here. Um, when we're talking about seeing Christ in the Old Testament in this specific way, um, we are in a sense talking about how people in the Old Testament were saved. Yeah. And when, when we immediately crack open that door, there's some dangers that we want to avoid yeah. and that they're very practical for us in the 21st century. Uh, could you maybe just spell out what would be one of those biggest concerns that we should have? And what are the what, what's a theological conviction that should be driving us in this conversation? Yeah, of course. It can be easy when we're, when we're having this discussion, the discussion about how were people saved in the Old Testament. It can be very easy to sort of draw this hard line between the Old Testament and between the New Testament. A lot of people would say, in the New Testament, we're saved by faith, but in the Old Testament, people were saved by works. And that that is, a, I think, a, an easy and natural conclusion to, to come to if you are sort of reading without really stopping to, to go deep and to, to think through these deep theological issues. But the, the Bible is very clear that of salvation is is by faith always by faith and specifically faith in Jesus regardless mm -hmm. of of where you are in in history even regardless of whether you're before or after mm -hmm. uh, Jesus lived so we we can think of verses like John 14 6 yep. Jesus says to the disciples I am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me we can think of Acts 4, 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given to man under heaven by which you can be saved. That name is Jesus. So then, Gary, if we're saying that people are saved by faith in Christ, what does this mean when we're talking about the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. This is really the important, this is the most important part of our discussion today. We'll get into some things that are less important and interesting, maybe only to theologians. Uh, but it is really important, especially in our society, where uh, pluralism is, is rampant, uh, where it's extolled, you know, the tolerance of all beliefs. Uh, the, and even on the compassionate side of us, we want to say that... Um, you know, that person who behaves well, doesn't God uh, regard that, that as, as an element of faith in, 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 in God and his, in his uh, uh, ethics, I guess. Um, so it, this is the critical question is, what is faith? And faith has an object. And so this is what Luke has just expressed. 
all faith has an object. That object, the object of saving faith, is always the same as what Christian faith is, and that's faith in Christ. And, and we really have to uphold that, even for the Old Testament saints. And that's why the writer of Hebrews, for instance, when we go through the Hall of Faith, talks about, by faith, Moses. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. All of these are testimonies to a faith they had, and it's a faith that was in Christ. Now, where the finer point comes of debate is what was the nature of that faith. But there's no debate that, like even, Andrew, if I could take the time. Yeah. This is really interesting and, and almost provocative that the writer of Hebrews says in verse 26, Moses considered the reproach of Christ. Now, <laughs> you could say that's a New Testament writer that is only writing backward with the knowledge of what Christ is, what the work of Christ is, who he was as a person. But boy, the most literal reading of that is that, that there's an object behind Moses' faith, a person that's behind Moses' faith, who we name Christ. Yeah, I, I think as well, uh, I think of John 12, where, so Jesus has... Um, he has just explained that he is, he is going to go to the cross. And then in, in John 12, after Jesus has said these things, um, we're mm, told yeah. in verse 37 that though he had done many signs before them, they still did not believe in him so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah might be fulfilled. Right. Lord, who has believed what, we have, uh, what he heard from us, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. And those words are spoken in Isaiah 6, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where Isaiah has this vision of the glory right. of God filling the temple. And then it says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory right. and spoke of him. So how do we make sense of this? That uh, are we saying that Isaiah actually saw Jesus Christ in the flesh? Yeah, and this is yeah, this is I guess where where we we struggle a little bit to to put a pinpoint on that. And thankfully, our our salvation doesn't rest on what we where we're going to land here. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I think of <coughs> Peter's. Uh, of Day of Pentecost preaching yep. as well, where he quotes from mm. Psalm 16. Psalm 16 is written by David, and the way he, he writes that, there's clearly an understanding of the, the person of Christ to some degree. I mean, you, you can't really read it any other way. Um, now, to your point, Andrew, we know Isaiah has a vision that yep. he's writing toward in Isaiah 6. We know other scriptures saying that no one has seen the face of God, and that is typically seen as God the Father. Uh, so, so does that leave us then with God the sent Son? Uh, people speak of the angel of the Lord, an angel being a sent one. Is that a, a, a Christophany, if you will, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament? I don't think we're going to demand anyone, bind anyone's conscience toward this, but, but again, we can't, I think... Some Christians will make the mistake of uh, denying the Old Testament prophets um, an understanding of salvation uh, that is, or they limit their understanding of salvation to only being a, prom a, a, a faith in a promise, a faith in God's faithfulness, if you will. And I think it's much more explicit than that when we read verses uh, such as this. And that's you know, I know one of the questions you're considering is how does the New Testament, how do New Testament uh, saints or mm -hmm. writers look back? And boy, it seems pretty explicit to me that there is a personal faith going on. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they saw the physical Christ. Right. Yeah. So if we if we hash this through, Christ doesn't become incarnate first of right. all until we come to the New Testament. He's not always been in a physical body. He took on flesh at a point in time in history. And so 
so definitely we need to make a little bit of a distinction there. So, so there was some sort of vision of Christ, how we understand that. We're going to try and process. Um, Luke, a couple of weeks ago in the e-bulletin, you talked about seeing Christ in the shadows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how might that concept maybe help us when we're thinking about seeing Christ in the Old Testament? I'm putting you on the spot here yeah. a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. All throughout the the Old Testament, especially all throughout all of the commandments and everything that God had set up for his people throughout the Old Testament, we, as I talked about a few weeks ago, we, we see shadows of Christ. We could see the, the sacrificial system and the sacrificial lamb pointing to Christ. We could see all these ways that that a piece or a shadow of Jesus could be seen in so much of what Israel did. And I think that especially becomes helpful and important in this discussion when we also stop to consider all the promises that God had already made to his people about, about what he would send, even from, from Genesis 3, promising to, to send one who would crush the, the head of the serpent. God, God had always had a promise to his people that that a savior would come. It was certainly, it, it, that promise became much more clear as time went on, but that, that promise was there from the beginning. And I think those promises combined with so many of the shadows that we can see in the, the priesthood and the, the temple and even the, the kings of, of Israel and maybe even more specifically, of course, King David. I think there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot for... I think even the, the people of the Old Testament to, to have faith in. So one of the things about the Old Testament is even with prophecy, prophecies aren't clear for the person who's testifying to them as to what its fulfillment is going to look like. So it could be it, it could be this great grand vision of a renewed future and um, all the nations streaming to Israel and everything seems to culminate in this one moment. But then when you get to the New Testament, you see that there are, it's like viewing mountain peaks that from a distance, it looks like there's just one mountain. But actually, as you climb that mountain, you discover you've gotten to the first ridge and there's another valley and then there's another mountain. And as you climb that, maybe there's another mountain behind it. And in some ways, it's helpful to recognize that the Old Testament writers, though they saw clearly a vision of God's future and who God is and what he was doing in bringing redemption, the details of that can often, they, they can all be blurred together like mm -hmm. multiple mountain ranges. That doesn't mean that, that God is confusing as much as it means that we are massively limited. So... Maybe Gary, to this to, to this point, then to get maybe a little bit more explicit. Yeah. How did people see Christ in the Old Testament? Well, I guess Luke, you've already touched on promises. You know, I was just thinking, Andrew, and I don't know the address to this immediately. I I think it's in Acts twenty six when Paul is defending himself, and he says. My preaching is no different than what the prophets have already spoken. So in a way, I think it's fair to say the gospel was presented in the Old Testament. I, I think we have to say that. Even though the expression, the, the, the best expression of the gospel, of course, is in the life and ministry of Christ. And this is where I'm going to play both sides of the fence. So I would, I would say the gospel is preached to the Old Testament. And so Old Testament saints have, in a sense, New Testament faith. They have yeah. a faith in Christ. And yet, I, I was thinking of 1 John 3, which is eschatological. So the beginning of 3 reads this, uh, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. So we're God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But what we know, uh, that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And so that also speaks, to, though, to this mm -hmm. idea of progressive revelation, that even us in the, 
in the New Testament world, on this side of the cross, we don't see Christ fully as he is. Yeah, and, and Paul will say that too in 1 Corinthians uh, 13, that we see through a glass dimly. dimly. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not that salvation is unclear. Uh, it's that how all of these pieces yeah. fit together, they are not clear to us. But a, So for a finer point, I think we can say the object is the same. The yes. gospel is the same front to back. Yes. All right. And the object of faith is always the same. So there isn't some kind of trickery going on for Old Testament saints. They're still, they still have faith in Christ. Now, the, the explicit, I, I think the, the clarity of presentation in the gospel would be different to your point in terms of prophecy. And that's partly what, what we're talking about here is prophecy in a way. Like, yeah. what is. Uh, the testimony of Christ is the spirit of prophecy, as Revelation says, and so this is what the gospel presentation is in the Old Testament. There's not the same clarity that we have clearly as clearly presented in the New Testament and us today. So, Even though the object is the same. Absolutely. <laughs> and the gospel is the same. The gospel is the same. The, the Lord is like the same. It's almost like it's in different clothing. Absolutely. Uh, Maybe, Luke, flesh out for us the idea of progressive revelation, because this becomes important. To, to understand how, how people clear, how clearly people saw Christ in the Old Testament. What is progressive revelation? Yeah, progressive revelation is, is the idea that God's entire salvation plan, his entire salvation story was revealed to his people in sort of in different ways throughout history. So at the at the beginning, it was maybe a little, little more vague, a little less clear. And in the book of Genesis, in, in Genesis 3, and what, what many people would call sort of the, the first gospel message and the promise of the, the snake crusher, and then God's promise to Abraham as well. Paul, Paul says in Galatians 3 that the gospel was preached to Abraham. It uses those very specific words. I think that's mm -hmm. a very, very important thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, to, to realize, even as we're having this discussion, that, uh, that the message has, has always been there, but it has sort of, over time, become clearer and clearer as God has revealed more and more and more to, to his people. Also, the, the keeper of the message is the same, yes. right? right. So, so there was extreme clarity as to the attributes of God to the Old Testament saints. So they are without excuse because they saw he is the great covenant uh, provider and covenant keeper. He is faithful to his promises. Mm -hmm. What does Moses appeal to as a mediator uh, throughout? We've just gone through the story of everything and, and through numbers. When he mediates for the people, he's not appealing to God uh, for, on their behalf for their merit or even what they may potentially do. They're going to be better tomorrow. It's he's appealing to his attributes. God, you have steadfast love. Yeah. You you have mercy, and you're 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 merciful and kind to a thousand generations. It's it's appealing to God's attributes, and so that was um, always clear to the Old Testament saints who it was that was keeping these promises. Yeah. Now, now most certainly we we can see that as the storyline of the Bible goes and moves forward in the Old Testament. We have hints and whispers. We know for sure a deliverer is going to come. He's going to come from Eve's line. It's not going to come from the serpent's line. But then we know that that child of deliverance is going to come from Abraham's family. And then we know that that child is also going to keep the law of Moses fully and completely, being a mm. prophet. We know through the covenant with David that he's going to rule on the throne and then we get whispers in Isaiah of a servant who is not just from Israel, but who is also from God. And, and David, we, we get the idea of, uh, I think it's Psalm 110, that the priest and the king are going to merge together and, and, and there's going to be someone who comes. But it still is shocking, to, even to the disciples in, in the Gospels, that it is actually God in flesh. Yeah. It shocks them. 
and, and yet they've got the Old Testament. And, and so what is it then, just we, we'll take a few extra minutes here, what is it then that is so shocking about that idea? Maybe Gary, I don't know if you, you want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I don't. There are a few ways we can take this. I guess one, it just is so counterintuitive. It it is baffling. It was, you know, foolishness to Greeks and Jews both. Yeah. Why? Because why would it's still baffling to a Muslim? If if you're going to explain your faith in explicit terms, they're going to say that's ridiculous. That God would so condescend Himself to take on flesh, He'd become like us. Come on, that can't be God. Uh, so that is so you're working against all of those presumptions of who and what God is and what this Savior would do politically, of course. Uh, and so that's partly it, I think, in that it's just a big hurdle to overcome in spite of all they knew from their Old Testament scriptures. Well, maybe to, to illustrate it too, we could think of you have a puzzle with uh, a thousand jigsaw, uh, uh, a jigsaw puzzle, a thousand pieces, but you don't have the final picture. You've got mm. all of the pictures uh, on the little pieces, but you're trying to put it together, and it doesn't always make sense. And what happens in the New yeah. Testament is that all those pieces suddenly come into clarity, and that each one of those pieces has a little picture on it in and of itself, but put together, they right. paint a whole picture. And so we can read backwards with a lot of clarity, but that doesn't mean that the Old Testament saints didn't have clarity about faith, that they did right. have clarity, but how all those pieces fit together, mm -hmm. that wasn't clear. We see this in theology too. We think of the theology of the Trinity, which we all would agree is biblical. Uh, we think of the theology, uh, Christology, for instance, yeah. not being fully formed really uh, until probably the 4th or 5th century, uh, yeah. you know, when they really started to uh, put a narrower point on Trinitarian and Christological thinking. Yeah. And that, it, it's in the Bible, but it took some time for, for Christians to realize this. And often, of course, it's, it's to protect the church against heresies, and so then you're promoted then, well, what is proper doctrine here? That's how the, a lot of these things develop, isn't it? So we've only scratched the surface of this topic. And 23 minutes is not enough. But just so that you have a confidence, salvation has always and will always be in Jesus Christ. Because he's sufficient. He's sufficient to save. Mm -hmm. And his death at the cross was sufficient for Old Testament saints as it is for you and for me today. How all those details work out, we'll spend an eternity grasping the depths of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, which, as Paul will say at the end of Romans uh, 11, how unsearchable his ways, how inscrutable his judgments, for who has known the mind of the Lord? Mm -hmm. So if you feel like, wow, we've just been drinking from the fire hose, that's what the Apostle Paul says too. So we'll look forward to seeing you Sunday. And uh, if you've got questions, uh, please email us. We are more than glad to carry on these conversations with you, and it's a joy. Um, I know, Gary, maybe you want to just testify to this, how uh, how congregants are a joy to us. So you gave me an example of someone this week. You don't have to mention any names. Yeah, but... yeah, it's just, um, we love hearing, not just, oh, a sermon's been great or a devotional's great, but if you could even be specific. I, I think of one congregant who sent an, an email in about two or three weeks ago, I think it's to both of us, and, and gave two or three just specific ways in which the Lord is working through our ministry. And, and that just makes our joy complete. Um, it's nice to hear a, a simple commendation, but boy, but when it can be specific as this is what the Lord is doing, uh, that's wonderful to hear. So Lord willing, we'll see you Sunday. And uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll rejoice in the Lord together. As always, thanks for joining us on Table Talk. Have a Bye -bye. great Friday.